What happens when your worst fear becomes your reality? Hi, I'm Brent Cassidy. Welcome to Nightmare Success in and Out Podcast, where we explore how to overcome your fears and nightmares to set yourself free. We're going to be exploring this topic with guys I was in Leavenworth with and others who served time at other prisons. We're going to be talking about life before prison, life in prison, and life out of prison. These stories can be inspiring, sometimes sad. There's some humor but hopefully you can come away with a nugget of something that will help you knock down some of the prisons you've built up in your own mind. Folks, today my guest is Marvin Cotton Jr. And I got to tell you, Marvin came to me uh, through an interesting route because my fraternity brother, Steve Green, was down in Florida. And Marvin, first of all, welcome. Welcome to the podcast. This is an honor to have you. Uh, thank you for being here. It's an honor to be here with you. So if I'm not mistaken, Marvin, were you guys in the airport? No, we were um, We were at um, um, uh, Universal Studios. Universal Studios, okay. Yes, sitting sitting at a restaurant slash bar type of um, 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 uh, venue. And uh, my girlfriend and I were sitting there, and uh, we were sitting next to uh, Steve. Yeah. And... And he actually gave up his gave up a seat so that we can have somewhere to sit. And sounds you know, like up, Steve. <laughs> yeah, good, good, good guy. Good guy. And you know that provoked me to you know engage him in conversation, and we started talking. And um, I, th- I think we both kind of spilled our whole life story like in five minutes to each other. <laughs> I love it. Well, I, yeah. I, I just I feel so lucky that you know Steve's a, a listener and is a friend, uh, and he's. You know, he's always trying to help out people and, you know, giving up his seat is just, you know, a testament to who, what kind of guy Steve is. But Steve, when he when he texted me, he said, hey, th- I just met a guy that would be incredible, has an incredible story. He said he served 20 years in prison. He's been out 19 months. He was exonerated from a crime he did not commit murder. And he's doing all kinds of good things. And I was like, oh, my gosh, absolutely. And then, Marvin, you and I connected, and you started sending me some of the things and the information and, and the background. And I couldn't wait to get you on and, and for the audience to hear your story. But let's step back a little bit because – the front part of this story, and we're going to talk a lot about what you're doing now because you're really doing some incredible things. But the back part of your story, what what was going on? I mean, because one night you're you're making a right turn to go pick up your daughter, and you're surrounded, and your whole life changes, and it changes from that point twenty years forward. What was going on as a kid? How, what were you doing, Marvin? And what was your life like growing up? Um, well, I grew up in Detroit, uh, which we kind of have a notorious reputation for being a, a pretty tough town. Um, and, and it is, um, you know, my, the neighborhood I grew up in was a pretty tough, pretty rough neighborhood. Um, I was raised by my mother, um, um, a single mother, and I think she did the, the very best job she could. Um, I didn't realize we were poor. Um, until I was almost, <laughs> I was almost in high school, but <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think my mother did a, a pretty good job in, in shielding us from a lot of things. Um, you know, my father, he was a, a drug addict and an alcoholic, um, my entire uh, childhood and, and, and most of my adulthood, he just cleaned himself up a few years ago. Did you um, have, did, Marvin, with that, did, as a kid, uh, did you have a relationship with him, or was it just a distance uh, that you knew that he was your dad and he had issues? The, the closest of a relationship I had with my biological father was, um, you know, broken promises. You know, I'm going to come get you and your brother this weekend. And, you know, I can't even count how often that happened. So mm-hmm. it was like really a string of broken promises. That was That was the relationship. And so, so, your, so your mom basically just stepped in, played both roles for you and your brother. Uh, absolutely. I'm, I'm sure she had to work to keep the house and, and job and you guys going. And what, uh, I, what was, did you guys, 
as far as growing up, you and your brother, did you play sports? Did you do anything? Like, how did you grow up? Um, my brother, my brother is the athlete. He he grew up playing sports. He got he got all of the all of the good stuff, and I got everything else that was left over. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was he was stronger than me. Um, even you know, I'm three years older, and 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 he's always been stronger than me. He's always been bigger than me. Um, and he, you know, he was a great athlete growing up, and it was a lot of you know, a lot of people paying attention to him um, through through the little league, yeah. all the way up through high school. Uh, unfortunately, he got into a car accident and got a close head injury, so it kind of derailed that path that he was on. But you know, mm. doubt in my mind, he probably was headed to the NFL. Mm. Wow, he he was that good. Yeah, but but myself, I I was more of a communicator, and uh, while everybody else was playing football, I was in the house on the phone with a girl or something. So <laughs> <laughs> good communicator, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> which serves you well now. Uh, so let's just go straight in. What because the day that this happened, um, the YouTube video that you sent me is riveting just the way that it's put together and you being right where it happened. And then you go back to the house that you grew up with. Can you kind of just walk us through where your nightmare began? Um, yes. Um, you know, that spot that's on the YouTube video where I was standing, that's, that's the spot that I was arrested in. That's where the handcuffs went on. Um, I actually rolled, rolled past that spot and stopped there last week. Um, just as a reminder, like when great things is happening in my life, yeah. I always go back there and go back to the old neighborhood just as a reminder to stay grounded yeah. um, to, to the things that I've survived um, and the fact that I'm here to experience better. Um, but that particular day, uh, I was headed to pick my uh, daughter up from daycare, and I noticed that a car was following me. Um, and I noticed because it, it, it made too many too many turns with me. And um, I was curious. I wanted to know who is this keep following me. So I, I drove around trying to find the car once I lost it and I wasn't able to find it. So as I got back on course to go pick my daughter up, um, uh, that car came out and it blocked me in. Another car blocked me in. And then I seen um, actual marked cars, marked police cars coming from everywhere. So um, at that moment, when I seen the other police cars, I knew that this was the police. Um, they got out and I remember a woman, um, she, she walked up to the driver's side window and she hit the window with the gun and she hit it so hard. It was, it was intended to get my attention, which it did. Um, and, and, you know, I still had my foot on the brake. The car was still in drive. I was too afraid to even put it in. Um, so I'm pointing down like the cars in park. I mean, the cars in drive, the cars in drive and, um, eventually I was allowed to put it in drive and get it, put it in parking, get out the car. Um, and that's where the handcuffs went on. Um, I didn't know why the police had surrounded me. Um, I didn't know that they were looking for me or anything like that. So, um, I was taken from that point down to the precinct in Detroit at that time. I know they were at 1300 Bobian, um, and everybody knows 1300 Bobian, you know, it has a, notorious reputation. Um, you know, if you went to 1300 Bobby and that, um, it was something serious and, and you might get, um, you, you might get some real cruel treatment, uh, mm -hmm. once you walk in those doors. Did they not say anything to you about, I mean, the, uh, I guess they would have said you were under arrest, but you did, you had no idea that this was a murder investigation or you were being, um, arrested for murder or I mean, cause I no, mean, not, your day not basically was normal to that point, right? You were just driving. Yeah, not, well, yeah, it wasn't normal. <laughs> but, no. no, I'm saying uh, your day um, was normal until they surrounded you and then absolutely. your whole world changed. Absolutely. Um, and you know, um, saying you under arrest, that's like, I've never heard that in, in any case, mm -hmm. uh, that's like TV. The police never say that you're under arrest. They right. just <laughs> slap the handcuffs <laughs> on. Right. Yeah, they put you. They put you under arrest. They don't read you your rights. They right. do that. They supposed to. They do it on TV. Right. But, um, um, yeah, I was taken down to the precinct and put in an interrogation room, where I was locked in a room for like thirteen hours without 
um, anyone saying anything to me. I wasn't allowed to use the bathroom. It was literally like a little closet um, with with a desk and a chair in it. Um, and, and I sat in there for about 13 hours before um, they pulled me out of that room and took me into a, a bigger interrogation room, which was more like an office. Um, and it was three detectives in there, and that's where the questioning began. Did you have any idea who they were talking about or what they were trying to get? I mean, was there, were you, how did they, how did they pin you for this crime, for this event? And did they start to, to, as the interrogation went, that you realized these guys absolutely don't know anything about anything that they're talking about? Right. It, it was a friend of mine that was that was murdered. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, I, I had a really bad history with law enforcement at that time. Um, you know, I had filed a complaint against some officers for um, breaking into my house. And that complaint that I filed turned into a huge investigation into the department. And it led to a lot of harassment, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of bullying, a lot of um you know, trying to force me away from that complaint, um, which eventually turned into federal indictments where officers were indicted uh, for breaking into my home. Um, That was a little later, but I I guess they knew that it was going in that direction. So my relationship with law enforcement was was pretty bad. So at at what point um, did you know that this – I mean, it, it, when you're having this conversation with them, you've got three detectives in there. They're probably saying everything that is doesn't connect. And are you asking for an attorney? Are you? Uh, are you? What, what's going through? What is going through your mind, Marvin? What What are you thinking? Um, well, I did ask for an attorney, um, but you know, just a little something about the three detectives that I was in this office with. Um, One of them would eventually serve federal prison time for 13 counts of bank robbery. Wow. Um, Another another one would be forced out of the department for um, uh, multiple DUIs and being caught with a handgun um, that I guess it wasn't registered to him or he wasn't supposed to have. um, um, And, you know, also been sued multiple times for mishandling or hiding or creating false, false, false witnesses. Um, in cases. And then the third one has been sued multiple times and is currently being sued by multiple different people for mishandling, hiding, and, and creating false false wow. witnesses. So these are the three. What a Molly crew you that, had to, to, right. be, to be interrogated by. Right. So, so I was actually the only person in the room um, that was innocent. Wow. What happened next? Um, well, the interrogation didn't last, um, you know, long. I, you know, requested an attorney. I want an attorney. Um, and, you know, I was put into a, a cell. And at every every point, at every stage, I never thought that I would get to the next stage. Right. At every stage, I'm like, I'm about to go home. Yeah. So at the point that I was arrested, I'm, I'll be out of here very soon. At the point of... Um, the interrogation, I'd be out of here soon. When they put me in the cell, I'd be out of here. They actually sent me over to be arraigned um, 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 three day, two days later. And something happened. Something was, I guess, was wrong with their paperwork or something. So they took me back over to the precinct. So in my mind, I'm like, I wasn't supposed to go over there anyway. So right. I know I'm, <laughs> right. I'm about to go home. And so they took me back over there the next day and arraigned me. And as you know, you have a preliminary hearing. Um, they have 14 days to get the hearing. So at every stage in my mind, I'm like, I'm about to go home because I know that I hadn't done anything and there's no reason for me to be here. And somebody's going to eventually see that I'm not supposed to be here and right. I'll be going home. Right. What's your, what's your attorney saying at this time? Um, well, if you Google my attorney, you'll see a lot of articles. Not only did I have a cast of um, detectives that I described, my attorney is described, the attorney that I had was described as the worst attorney in Michigan. So you said, um, you just had some bad luck running, Marvin. <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a storm. Um, I think it's another word that can go in front of that. Yeah, perfect but storm. Definitely a storm. Yeah. 
Um, so, so mm-hmm. he, he didn't really communicate well. He didn't do uh, a good job investigating at all. A lot of the things that I wanted him to follow up on or ideas that I had, um, he didn't, he didn't pursue. Um, so eventually when I was in the county jail awaiting trial, um, the, the, they come saying that they, they have a jailhouse informant, um, um, witness. This was four days before trial. Okay. Um, so when I eventually get the statement and I read this statement, I tell my attorney, I'm like, this did not happen. I don't know who this person is. This didn't happen. Um, so we go to court and I was able to show some documents that, um, what this, what this jailhouse informant was saying was not true. So all that happened was when he came into court, he just changed his statement to kind of fit around, uh, what I had said to be able to show that, you, you know, it, it it was crazy, but what turns out to happen is the jailhouse informant eventually, many years later, maybe um, 16, 17 years later, uh, admitted that, you know, um, uh, the police had gave him the information to come into court and testify. Sure. And the detective that was on his statement that took that statement was um, um, the detective that served the time for the bank robberies. Wow. And you, know, yeah. and you hear about that a lot where you, the, the jailhouse uh, informant is, is also given the opportunity to lessen their time or their, their charge or whatever that is. Uh, and that's, that yeah, just, the, doesn't just happen once. One, it happens a lot. Yeah, One of the threads that most exonerees have, people that's been exonerated, that has been found to be innocent, one of the main things besides police misconduct is jailhouse informants is tied to almost every single exoneration Yeah, where they're coming into court saying this person confessed to me, this person told me this about the crime and then DNA exonerates them. This person told me about this, about the crime. And then they find out that this, this jailhouse informant is lying. Right. So jailhouse informant uh, testimony is so unreliable that it's almost a red flag when they use a jailhouse informant. It's almost a red flag that this person may be innocent. Right. That this this is actually an innocent person here because of this. So uh, tell me a little bit about what goes on now with the with the trial and 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 how how does that all play out? Um, you know, trial is one of the toughest things that a human being can go through. Um, it's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of stress. You know, especially when your entire life is on the line. You're, you know, I was charged with first degree murder and felony firearms. You know, what's, first degree murder kid. What's your mom thinking through this thing here? Because it's had to have just turn her upside down. You no, know, I watch my mother age rapidly. Yeah. Um, you know, just in a year, two years, three years, four years, um, to where after several years of being in prison, I watched my mother, um, you know, turn into a a old woman mm-hmm. um, just in a matter of a few years. And now that I'm out, it's like her age is reversing. Yeah. Like right before my eyes, it's like, it's, it's coming back off of her. Um, and I'm very, very thankful um, and grateful for that. But, you know, it, it, it really tore up, you know, when you have the, the, the people of the state of Michigan, you know, versus yeah. your name, you know, that's a lot of weight. Um, and, and a lot of resources and a lot of people and a lot of talent just lining up um, in order to, to win. And, and, and that's a pretty big thing for family and supporters to really rally behind. You know it. Yeah. Um, you know how family and friends and people that you were acquainted to and laughed at your every joke. Yeah. Um, when you had the United States of America versus. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's, get... it's the most daunting thing you'll ever see. Absolutely. And, and when you know, you know, I, I knew that I was fighting for my life. You know, Michigan has a mandatory sentence of, um, of life without the possibility of parole for a first degree murder conviction. Um, and, and you know, that pressure, you wake up thinking about it. You wake up in the middle of the night thinking about it. You wake up in the morning thinking about it. And it's constantly on you. You feel the weight of it on you. Um, and I really started. You know, when you're up against something like that, it, it does something to you. You know, you're staring death in the face. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have the extra stress of knowing that you're not supposed to be in here. I'm not supposed to be in here. I'm not supposed to be fighting this. Right. Um, so that's extra weight. 
you know, even for a guilty person, I can only imagine that trial is stressful. Sure. Um, but for myself, being innocent, it was very stressful. It was very heavy. Um, but it does something to you because either you're going to respond to that heaviness or it's going to crush you. Mm -hmm. So either you're going to get stronger, you're going to get smarter, you're going to get sharper, you're going to get faster. You're going to start seeing things in ways that you never could have seen unless you went through that circumstance. Yeah, heightens and that's what I think. Yeah, it started happening to me. I, I noticed it after maybe five, six, seven months um, in the county jail. It, it started to, to really change. It started to grow me. Mm -hmm. Interesting. How long, did, how long did this whole process take from the time they picked you up to the time you got convicted of, of wrongfully convicted of murder? Um, I was arrested uh, February the 19th, um, 2001, and I was convicted October 19th, 2001. So, you know, just in that, that short time, um, you know, I was in the county jail maybe nine, ten months uh, before I entered prison. And the blow of being found guilty, everybody always asks, like, what were you thinking when you heard guilty? Yeah, that's what I was going to um, ask you. Yeah. I know I'm asked that almost every, every interview. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so you don't hear guilty. You don't, you don't really hear the words because, you know, your heart's pounding. Um, you know, your, your ears are deafened. And you're there and your eyesight is... Um, really as sharp as it's ever been because your other senses has dulled. So I was, I found myself looking around the room, searching faces for um, indications. Um, you know, when the jury came in, I'm looking at their faces and yeah. I'm seeing, I'm seeing a few of them crying. So now I'm, I'm really scared. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I really can't hear anything because I'm seeing tears. Why are they crying? Like, are they, yeah, are they crying? Yeah. Right, they're crying for me, or are they crying about a decision that they just made? Yeah. Um. So I'm searching faces, and 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 the judge is looking, and he's looking over at us, and um, he hands it back, and and the jury begins to read it, and and I don't I don't hear it, but I'm looking at the faces, and I'm looking around the courtroom um, to my family and friends, and um, you know, when I see everybody else crying, I know like whoa. Um, the verdict must not be good at all. And it, and it wasn't. Um, and, you know, immediately after the verdict was read, um, there was about 20 um, sheriff deputies in there and they ushered me off to the back. Um, and, um, you know, I remember being real numb, uh, feeling real numb, but I was aware enough that as soon as I was placed in the back, there was an attorney that came to the window um, back there to talk to another client. And as soon as he finished with his client, I said, I said, what's your name? Um, and he said his name. I said, I need an attorney. I need to appeal this. I need to appeal this decision. This was like two minutes later. Um, I, you know, that was my first, like, um, that's when I noticed that I had an ability uh, to rise above, what was going you know, on. Yeah. absolutely to get focused. Yeah. And, you know, as you know, it took me 20 years um, to get out of prison and to establish that I was never supposed to be in there. And so I had to do that a lot. Yeah. So when, so when I started winning, uh, um, I didn't know how to feel when I win, but I knew I knew what I needed to do when I lose. Right. Right. Yeah. So, Marvin, you get uh, the the verdict. Um, Take, take me through your your first day of heading into prison um, as you know a guy you know I mean you know you're innocent you know you've you, you know you want to appeal this you know that you have to do everything you can to keep your mind um, being you uh, what's what's it like entering into prison that way um you know I, I made I made the decision um, a conscious decision to um, do my time a certain way um, I'm an innocent man. I'm going into an environment where nobody's going to see me as that. Right. But I didn't change, you know, who I was. Um, you know, I, I, I stayed respectful. Um, I stayed courteous. Uh, I, I built up some very good discipline. 
um, when I was in there. But I walked in knowing that I needed to become better. Yeah. Um, that, I, that I needed to grow my mind because the people that put me in prison um, obviously was pretty smart in order to put together what to they put you together there. to put me in prison. Right. right. So I knew I needed to build my mind equally or better in order to overcome um, the circumstances. So I walked in with that mentality. I remember um, really contemplating that and I couldn't even imagine what that looked like. So I knew that I needed to be better, but I didn't know what better looked like. Right. I knew I needed to be smarter, but I can't, I, I, if you can think that thought, then you're already there. I couldn't even imagine yeah. what that meant. Yeah. So that that's how my journey started. Um, my first day in prison, um, which was at the notorious Jackson quarantine. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard I've of heard Jackson stories prison. about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very notorious um, prison. I believe um, when it was fully open, fully operational, it was like 7,500 uh, prisoners there. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I, when I come through there, it was not that many, it was not that many prisoners there, but it was still notorious nonetheless. You know, my first day there, it was, um, you know, people are lighting fires and throwing it on officers and, you know, officers was, you know, beating um, guys up and pepper spraying them. It was, it was crazy. And all this was like my first day there. Mm. So I'm laying there choking, trying to get some rest and choking off pepper spray. And I'm like, is this what prison is about to be like? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is this, is this where I'm at? Um, and, and it didn't disappoint because, um, for the most part, you know, prison was just like that. I've been to some of the most toughest prisons in Michigan, um, you know, for long periods of times. And, you know, I can remember like months, month after month after month where there was violence every single day. Um, so yeah, prison is a very volatile, very tough place. Um, but what that did is when I'm in tough environments, um, for some reason, it helps me grow. Mm -hmm. So when everything is tough and everybody else is falling apart, um, I, I I realized that I had an ability to really stay calm and really rise above and think myself out of uh, the circumstances that's around me. Did you feel that Marvin, when you were growing up or is it something that came to you as you went through this, this particular part of your life? Um, you know, um, growing up, um, you know, my mother um, was in a few relationships that was pretty um, abusive and, and violent. And I remember growing up as a child um, and being afraid all the time. Yeah. You know, when, when I was a, a kid, like I'm talking, you know, two, three, four, five, six, seven years old. I remember just being afraid all the time. And um, my mother eventually got into a relationship with somebody that wasn't abusive. And, and um, through that uh, relationship that I built with him, um, he taught me how not to be fr- afraid anymore. Um, he taught me how to defend myself. He taught me how to stand up for myself. He taught me how to stand up for my family and my mother. And um, even to him, um, if he wasn't uh, doing what he was supposed to do. And, and that helped me a lot. So I think I took that ability of not being afraid to every circumstance that I've been in um, after that point in my life. Wow. What a good mentor to come to you at that time in your life uh, as a kid who was afraid and he, he picked you up and basically taught you. That's, 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 uh, that's incredible really to think about it. You'd, you'd seen bad things and he knew you were going to see other bad things, but he was going to teach you how to, to step into that. That's absolutely. Um, we didn't talk too much. I, I meant to ask you, you know, with your daughter, at the age she was, how old was she when, when this happened? When it first happened? Um, she was, she was two and a half. Yeah. Two and a half years old. So, I mean, that, that to me, I mean, my gosh, to have her that age and know that you're going away for what you, at the moment that you get, you know, told by the, the court that you're going to go away for life. Um, I guess she stayed, did she stay with your mom? No, she stayed. She stayed with her mother, okay. um, um, who did, who did an awesome job with her. She she'll be twenty four in a couple of months, and um, she's an amazing young woman, um, entrepreneur, 
a very driven, very disciplined. Um, beautiful um, girl. I, I've, you've sent me the pictures and different things of her in that. And it's uh, just, you can tell she's, she's accomplished as a, as a person, which yeah. is, I think yeah. always a fascinating thing because she would have had to have lived those 20 years of coming to visit you in an yeah. awful place to visit and you know, I always say when people go to prison, their family goes to prison because they, they have sure. to live through all those things that you're going through, but they're on the outside and it's not easy on the outside. So it's, um, it's always such an accomplishment when you see a family survive that. Cause I, I you know, I, cause I think there's two ways to go on it, Marvin, you could have been a victim and we're a, a victim wrongly accused, but you just, you chose to flip the script and become a survivor through this and basically take on what you needed to take on to get to what your ultimate goal was, which I think is, you know, it's incredible. The story is incredible, but, but as you are going through this environment that is the unknown world that you've entered, uh, what were the connections you made? Uh, how did you start connecting and, and living your life there? Um. You know, I also made the decision when I entered prison that I wasn't going to get comfortable and I wasn't going to assimilate. I wasn't going to become such a big uh, thing. I was, right. I wasn't going to let the culture really swallow me up. Yep. So um, I didn't, I didn't buy gym shoes in prison. You know, so you can buy gym shoes to work out in and um, um, sweats, certain, certain um, jogging suits so that you can wear to work out in. I didn't buy none of that. Uh, I wore prison blues. I wore state shoes, very uncomfortable shoes. Very My feet uncomfortable feet shoes. Right now. I don't even know how they make those things. <laughs> right. They don't look <laughs> like, you know, the funny thing is they don't look like if you look at them in pictures, like, I don't see anything wrong. Put them on and try to walk in them for a while. <laughs> and they're heavy too. Yeah. Um, so, so, so I made sure that I kept myself uncomfortable. Um, and because the thought of buying something that I've seen so many guys take uh, pleasure and pride in yeah. drove me crazy um, because it was almost like being happy or being comfortable in prison. Yeah. So I kept myself uncomfortable uh, for 20 years. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think that's, that's a, that whole thing that you're talking about, because if you do fall into that, if you do assimilate the, the fear of that, my fear was is always to become institutionalized. And right. when you become institutionalized, you get so used to the bad routine um, that that becomes your comfort, the bad routine. Right. And then you, you can't reach to the opportunity of whatever is good because you're scared to step out of this comfort zone that's actually really ugly. And, and, and right. it happens a lot. I mean, you see, you know, I always say you see two people in prison. You see people that are making it work and you see people that have given up and you know, there's that, that famous line in, in uh, Shawshank where you say you get busy living or get busy dying. That's kind of what you see in prison. You see people who are going to try to make it work and try to be who they are regardless of where they are. And you see the people who become institutionalized who just more or less have given up and, and sure. become part of the system. So, um, you know, every, I've been to 14 different prisons. Um, every, every prison that I was at, there was always at least one officer, usually more than one officer, but at least one officer that would pull me to the side and say, I don't know what you're in here for or what's going on, but you're not supposed to be you're here. You're not supposed to be here. Like, 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 I don't know anything about you, but I've been watching you and you're not supposed to be in here. Yeah. I heard that at every, and it, and it was always the worst officer that told me that. That's interesting. The worst. It was, it, it was always the, the officer that came to work to break somebody. Yeah. Um, and, and they would pull me to the side and say, I don't know why you're here, but you're not supposed to be in prison. Marvin, why did you, why were you in so many different prisons? That's a lot of different prisons. Cause I, I mean, prisoners hate to move around and you know, you all, you have your stuff basically, you know, for me it was a locker, a plastic chair and a bunk bed, but the, to move around 14 times and have to get, you're set again. How, why, yeah. why did you have that as a thing I, going on in prison? I, I became, um, um, very influential, um, in prison because, you know, 
like what I'm doing now. I taught people, I mentor. Yeah. Um, and I would, I would, I would teach the worst of the worst. So mm-hmm. the gang leaders, not, not just the gang member, but the gang leader, mm-hmm. I would pull them up under me and I would teach them, um, try to grow them out of, um, their thinking. And, and that took some time and, and, and it took to be very strategic in order to do that. Um, and they didn't like that type of influence. Um, you would think that the institution would like, um, you know, people being mellowed out and turning right. people into thinkers and, um, you know, getting them out of their criminal, but they, but they, they, they like division in prison. Sure. Because it's, it's easier to control the institution if you're staff, if yeah. everybody's divided. Yeah. Um, and very what, primitive, you know, like very people. primitive environment in prison where the people are right. divided up. Yeah. I like peace and harmony. So, you know, I grew up in a chaotic, a chaotic home. You know, my home life was chaotic. I grew up, like I told you, afraid all the time, afraid of noises and sounds yeah. and, and everything. So as an adult, when things get chaotic, my mind begins to, to find ways to, to, to create peace. Yeah. So here I go in prison, one of the most chaotic environments I've ever been in. Yeah. And I found that I was pretty good at creating peace. Um, and that made me a threat. And, and, and I, I think out of the 14 prisons, I believe, uh, I don't know if you know what an emergency route out is, is where they come get you in the middle of the night while you sleep, handcuff you, put you in a hole and send you to another prison the very next morning before anybody else wake up. So, um, that happened to me about 10 times. Um, that's really interesting, Marvin, because you would think, like you said, that the people running the prison would appreciate that. And what that got you was a trip to the hole and to another prison. Yes. What kind of jobs did you do to kind of keep your mind in place in prison? I've had every type of job you can think of. I've been, <laughs> I've been, a, I've been a porter or a janitor. I've been, I've worked in the kitchen. I've always moved to the top of every job that yeah. I that I that I had in prison. Um, I had um, some of the most trusted jobs being the photographer in the visiting room. Yeah, um, I've done that for like maybe six years at multiple different prisons. Uh, six years combined. Um, I've always had lead positions. Um, you know, in the kitchen. I'm a perfectionist, so when I'm when I do a job. I like to do it well. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I don't complain about anything and, you know, I'm not going to try to make nobody else do this or do that. I'll do it myself and I'll get it done. So that's always been my mentality. I love that though. I mean, you didn't lose that in prison. I mean, it would have been so easy for you to just say, you know, what the hell with it? I, 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 I've, I shouldn't even be here and, and stop being, what made you, you, but what you did is you, you had this leadership quality and everything that you were put into, um, you try to make better, which is in a bad world. That's a really good thing. Um, so going through what you're going through, I'm sure you were, you know, constantly daily, uh, trying to get to your case and getting these appeals. Uh, how did you handle hard days in prison? Um, um, you know, and I know, I know eventually, you know, you, you will meet people that, that have known me for, for many years and people that I was in prison with. Um, no, most people didn't know that I was serving a natural life sentence because I was always the same. I didn't allow my bad day to spill outside of me, um, because I was responsible for a lot of people. A lot of people were dependent on me. Um, they were looking, you know, at, at my strength and my guidance in order to kind of keep them on an even keel. Mm-hmm. So I knew I couldn't really show anything. Um, and then I kind of worked on myself by working on other people. Um, but would you um, say that was you know, one of your big strategies in prison? Uh, Marvin is, is taking what you had inside you and helping other people in a positive way that that filled you up in a, in a way that you liked yeah. and helped you get through your time. Every time I did something for someone else, I was operating on myself. Yeah. Um, you know, since I've been, since I've been out, um, I got out October 1st, 2020. Um, people say from day one, like you don't wear prison on you. Yeah. You don't, you don't, you don't wear it on you. Um, uh, that's because I was getting prison off of me the entire time the that I was time in there. You were in there. Yeah. yeah. Right. So I didn't, you know, a lot of, a lot of guys, they get out and it, it takes them several months, if yeah. not longer to kind of, get that prison off of them. Yeah. Um, but I was working on getting it off of me um, long before I walked out of the door and, and trying to help other people. 
get well, it off of them as well. Marvin, when did you start knowing? Because you, you were talking about a span of time of twenty years. When, when did you start knowing that that you things might be going your way uh, on the outside with the legal piece of your case? I mean, how did that how did that all work? The thought of I will be going home at this next this next date has always been my mentality It's yeah. to the point to where I was the only person believing it. <laughs> <laughs> so, the power so, of one. so yeah. So every appeal was, this is it. Every rehearing to every denial was, this is it. Every reconsideration to every, uh, rehearing this was, is this it. is it. And, um, you know, two dozen, two dozen appeals. Um, and, and, and it took that long, but when the conviction integrity unit, um, took up my case, um, that was, that was big for me. Let's talk about that a little bit, Marvin, cause, um, this is a unique, um, it's actually the first I had read of it. And I, I think, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if it was in every single prosecutor's office, but in this office, they created a special division, which is really like a mini innocence project um, of them looking at questionable cases. And it's what, what's, what was the name of it again? I've the conviction integrity unit, conviction integrity unit. So these uh, people decided that they were creating a special division to look at questionable cases. They picked up your case. And then what, what started happening? Um, uh, uh, prosecutor Kim Worthy, um, of Wayne County, um, she started a conviction integrity unit within her office. Um, it's a pretty revolutionary idea because as you know, prosecutors don't like Mm-mm. their cases to be reviewed. Mm-mm. Um, and, and I'm very fortunate to have, um, come out of Wayne County where this prosecutor, uh, was brave enough to, to, to lead in that way. Um, so she started this unit and she put, um, a director over this unit, um, a woman named Valerie Newman. Uh, Valerie Newman is very known in the, in the legal world throughout the country, but, um, she put her in, in this role as the director and it was really a, you know, it took a perfect storm or, um, um, of circumstances in order to lead to my wrongful conviction. And it really, um, ended up with a perfect storm of people in the right places at the right time in order to uh, dwell back off into this case. But the conviction integrity unit is, is, is in the prosecutor office, but there is, is some separation there, mm-hmm. of course. Um, but all of the investigators in, in this unit is former homicide detectives um, um, and, and, and prosecutors. So you have all of this talent with inside information on how the system works. Right. Um, and they spent, they spent two and a half years on my case, but when they accepted my case, that's when I think time started moving slower. Sure. Um, things got harder because when you're in a situation like the situation that I was in and everybody's giving up on you, when people start to believe in you, it starts to get hard because now you're, in, inside your head, you like I've been telling y'all that I'm <laughs> all this for, time, all this time, and now people are starting to believe in you, and then time gets really hard. Yeah, because now you know they're finding out information, um, and they're getting information, and and they were on it, mm-hmm. and 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 now you're like, okay, people know I'm innocent. I need to go home. I want like, to go right home now. now. Right. Right. So it took some time. I can't and, imagine and the excitement bit. from your family knowing after all this that your case gets picked up and they start pulling pieces together of what your innocence is. And like you said, it would feel like, you know, that you're swimming through molasses because as these pieces come, you know what the end result is. You've always been innocent. How can we get this sped up to get it over with? Right. Um, and, and, and it is interesting. Um, I found out. Um, that I was going home on a on a Monday, and I had went out to the yard, um, the prison yard, where you know people walk around or work out or stand around and talk. And I was out there working out, you know, in prison. I, you know, that was a part of my uh, fix to keep my mind right. right. You know, I, I had a, a very strenuous workout, like every day. You know, that was that was my thing, and I was coming off 
of the yard and I walked into the housing unit and I'm still in, in war mentality because my workouts is like going to war. So mm-hmm. I'm feeling like my war mentality. And I wasn't even going to use the phone, but I heard a voice just like, call home. And, and I always listen to that inner voice because, you know, oftentimes it's right. And I, I called home instead of getting in the shower because you know how hard it is to get in the shower and <laughs> prison. Everybody's waiting. Yep. You know, right. So in the, uh, I had came in before the yard closed so that I wouldn't have to be in a line. And I ended up calling my mother. And, and when I called her, she like, um, you know, it's over. I'm like, what you mean it's over? And she was like, uh, it's over. I'm like, what are you talking about? She was like, I talked to your attorney and this and that. So I said, let me call you back. Marvin, I can't imagine what was racing <laughs> through your mind when she said that. Yeah, so I, I called my daughter. I hung up and I called my daughter. And my daughter is the calmest, coolest. <laughs> you can't you can't get a read on, on this girl for yeah. nothing. So I called my daughter. I'm like, what's going on? Um, she like nothing. I'm like, how your day going? And she like, I'm going good. I say, you got anything you want to tell me? She was like, no. I was like, you sure? She was like, what you mean? I said, are you sure? I said, did you talk to my lawyer? She was like, you're not supposed to know. I said, so you wasn't going to tell me? <laughs> she should be an actress. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking about she's, she's cool and calm no matter what's going on. She's the coolest person in the room. Um, so so once my daughter uh, told me, my daughter, she's a, 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 100, a 100 type of person. Yeah. If she says it, like, she's not going to add or take away anything from anything. And, and, and from that moment, a numbness came over me, very similar to the numbness when I was found guilty. Yeah. Um, um, very similar to the numbness when I was arrested and it's a profound numbness just like, and I didn't sleep from yeah. that day forward for like eight days. So I found out on a Monday, I got out Thursday, uh, and, and I, I stayed woke for another four days. Oh man, no sleep until my body shut down on me. But that numbness, um, it took like three weeks to start to dissipate, and then it took several more months to completely like go away. I, so when you, I first got out, yeah, I was going to tell I you, found my, I, I found myself. You know, everybody's excited. Everybody I come in contact with, they're crying. Yeah, I'm talking about people I haven't heard from in 20 years. They see me. Sure. They're looking at me like they've just seen a ghost. They're <laughs> crying. So I found myself pretending. Yeah. Um, because I was so numb inside. Yeah. That I didn't. I didn't know how to react or respond. So I found myself uh, responding or reacting in ways that I thought people would expect. Yep. Um. I get that. So. Yeah. So. So. But eventually, you know, the numbness started to, you know, dissipate. But even though I was numb, um, I got out. As you know, I hit the ground. A lot of people say you hit the ground running. I hear that like every day. Um, was there a and, lot of and cameras and involved. stuff, Marvin, when you got out? Because it would have been a fairly big thing that somebody just re- was released uh, for 20 years in prison, there, wrongly convicted. There was, there was a guy, um, uh, Lucino Hamilton, mm-hmm. who spent 27 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. He was released the day before me. Wow. So so my press release and his press release um, was what, about the same time. So I believe that his case um, may be overshadowed. So when I walked out the parking lot, there was um, no one out there but my mother and my daughter. Wow. Okay. Um, which, which, which I'm grateful oh, for. Oh, yeah. I think I that'd needed, be great. I needed that. Your own special um, time. Absolutely. And I, and I told my mother, you know, they hugging me. And I told my mother, I said, get in the car. Let's go. <laughs> let's get out of, let's get out of here ride. as fast as we can yeah. So, yeah. Marvin I, the thing that I watched on uh, YouTube where there were all those people on that Zoom call and yeah. and they it's like the official thing that they're they're saying you know you're free um, was was that like you already knew that with um, your phone call with your mom and your daughter or was that a zoom call that happened as it was all happening. Well, no, um, the phone call with my mother and daughter was Monday. Um, that, that recording that's on the YouTube video, that was Thursday. Oh, that was the day. Okay. That was the day. Now I talked to my attorney, I believe Tuesday. So my attorney, she confirmed that she called up to the prison. She told me everything that was going to take place. 
Um, it still didn't seem real. Yeah. Um, I'm sure. I, so, I mean, how could so, it after all that time? Even while I was on the Zoom hearing, um, you know, waiting, I listened to. That was emotional the, for me to watch. You know, the, yeah. the, uh, it, you, you can hear me sniffling. You can yeah. hear me sniffling. Yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 I was sitting in my car. <laughs> you sent all that to me, and I was sitting in a parking lot. I stopped off at Walgreens to pick something up, Marvin, and I started clicking on your stuff. And I thought, wow, I hope nobody's watching me. I'm sitting in my car here crying watching this YouTube thing. But so powerful, though. Gosh, I mean, just the feeling that they they said those words and everybody's, I mean, I don't know how many people were on that Zoom call, but there you are. And there all these other people are. And it's official. And it's like, man, I, what? it's it's beyond what you see on movies because it's real. This is This really happened. Absolutely. Um, the, as soon as the judge made her statement and, um, and she said that she wanted me released immediately, um, you know, I got antsy, you know, the, the zoom went off. I stood up, I was in a, a little room that they yeah. have, um, for, for, for zoom hearings and I'm pacing in the floor now. So <laughs> now I'm ready to go. Yeah. Get me out of this place. Um, and, and the officers, it's, it's interesting. Um, all of the officers, they shook my hand. Um, Which you know, they don't the, do, the administration, doesn't. like the, the warden, the deputy warden, the captains and lieutenants. And um, they, they seemed they seem genuinely happy uh, for me and, and sorry that I had been through that. Um, you know, the prisoners, they picked up my property, uh, a whole lot of them. And and marched me up to the control center with my property. The officers told me, y'all can't do that. They're like, we walking him we're, um, yeah. up front. So it was, <laughs> we're it was, doing it. Was it. like a big thing. Yeah. <laughs> Got a parade here. Uh, I, I mean, it's just, it's, and we need to, at the end of this, tell them how to get on that YouTube piece there, Marvin, just for people to be able to see that, because I just think it's, it's so powerful. But, okay, so you get out, and I, well, let's talk about what you're doing now, because, uh, you know, I was thinking about, you know, 19 months, 19 months isn't that amount, much amount of time, but you have stepped up and you have taken a role with these people who've been exonerated. There's a uh, part, of, part of one of those YouTube pieces is you interviewing all these different guys that have been a part of this project that have, have, have been released. I mean, and it's the years that we're talking about on, on these people. It just, it takes your breath away. But you can tell what you walking through that that you kind of are the coordinator guy that they all see as somebody that's is kind of the glue keeping all this together as these guys get out and how this project works. Can you let everybody know what you're doing now and, and the good things that, that's going on in your life? Yes, that was actually that part of the video is a recording from uh, – January, um, after the October I was released. Wow. So that was just after a few months, um, of being released, but I helped, um, uh, I founded an organization called the organization of exonerees. I was the first, um, chairperson of that organization. And it was composed of all exon all exonerees, people that has been exonerated, um, to help, um, um, connect them with resources. Um, you get out of prison after 20, 30, um, 40 years, you know, you don't have the you family have support. Right. You don't have anything. So you're yeah. building your life from nothing. Um, so I help um, connect people with therapists and organizations that want to help, you nonprofits know, that want to help, um, uh, help people jump over um, state and city hurdles that they really don't have the information to get through. You get out, you don't have driver's license, you don't have ID, you don't have birth certificate, social security, right. you don't have anything. You're just dropped, and, and it's just like a new bird dropped into a nest, and, and you got to survive. Absolutely. So that's what the organization, but we've grown. I still sit, sit on the board of that organization, but we've traveled the country. We've advocated for innocent people all around the country. Uh, we're doing some amazing things. Um, um, the organization has grown. Um, well beyond what I had thought or imagined in the beginning. Marvin, um, how, and I, how many people have been released like you have in the, in the state of Michigan? 34 and in the last three years. In the last three years. And that's one yes. state. That is one yes, state. Yes, one state. Yes. The uh, attorney general here, she, she started a conviction, a state conviction integrity unit. 
So she has a conviction integrity unit. We um, help Washington County get funding for their conviction integrity unit. We testify to the, um, the, the the commissioners there to get them money, and we sat and talked with them and let them know some things that was working great in Wayne County um, and, and, and some of the struggles that we had, um, you know, just waiting on that long process. It takes money and manpower in order to look into these cases. Um, we've gone into um, uh, Oakland County as well as Macomb County. Um, um, so we've traveled the state. Um, our goal is to help every prosecutor office get a conviction integrity unit. I mean, to, that, to really show, that would be show incredible. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and obviously would the results, here's what I was going to say when you were saying that, because with the results that that's had in three years, if you can imagine what that would be in the, the United States, no. if it was set up the way that Michigan has done the same thing, I think it, it really opens people's minds to, uh, what needs to be done to what's being done. And, and you putting your voice to this is, is incredible. I, um, and I, I think you are good to talk about what you're wanting to do for your next step here, right? With, with stepping uh, into the political world. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I've come to many different tables uh, since I've been out working with prosecutors and law enforcement, sheriffs, um, 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 chiefs of police, and, um, um, really every level of government, attorney generals, and, um, you know, trying to make things better, advocating um, for changes and, and to really evolve uh, this union that we live in to make it better and better. Um, now I'm pursuing, um, I'm running for a state representative in the 11th district in Michigan. So now I'm trying to go to the other side of the table in order to make change from the other side. Um, I deal, I've dealt with many legislators, um, um, over this last 19 months. And a lot of them are big advocates for some of the issues that I'm pushing. Um, but now I'm trying to take a seat on the other side so that I can push these issues from there. I love it. I love it. Get, I mean, so I filed, yeah, I filed about a week, about a week and a half uh, or so ago. And I've been organizing my team and, and building support behind the scenes and, um, you know, out front. So this is going to be an interesting year. Um, I think that I can win. I, I really do believe that I can win. And I, I know with the help of the people that support me, I know that I can make that a reality. And, and the thing of it is, I mean, gosh, people, you know, in politics, we need a voice like this because you've lived it. Um, you actually are so good at talking about what this is about. Um, so, and, and you, you have the ability to bring people together because you – you did it in prison and you're doing it when you're out and you can do it with the overall population in the political side. And that's the type of people that need to get into politics, people who can actually affect change, not just to be there because it's a, it's a position of, of, of what am I, what's the word I'm looking for just to be there and just, just to raise money. People who actually want to affect change is where that, that belongs and that seat belongs to. So I, I couldn't be more excited for you, Marvin, doing what you're doing. Um, as we get to the end here, I want everybody to be able to, to get your information on how to contact you. But one of the things I was wanting to ask you, because of everything that you've lived through through this, what do you think, to impart to the listeners out there, what do you think is your biggest takeaway from what, you, what your life has been and how you've survived um, it? Um, I believe that, uh, you know, everybody goes through hard times. Um, um, some hard times, um, you know, may become, you know, come from decisions that we've made. We bump our head because we make a bad decision. And all of us go through hard times that's undeserving, suffering that's undeserving, where we sit in there like, why why me? Why am I going through this? Um, and, 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 and that's the point where I tend to connect with people because, you know, for a large uh, portion of my life, uh, 49% of my life, yeah. um, that, that was, um, what I was going through. But as long as you are alive, um, as long as you have breath to experience a bad time, you are in a good position. Wow. That's you, deep. You are in a good, you are in a great position if you are alive to experience a bad time because you are alive to overcome it. I love it. Um, and that's, that's really my motto right there. Man, that's deep. And I love that. 
if you're alive to experience a bad time, that means that's a good thing because you can overcome it. Absolutely. Man, that's powerful stuff, Marvin. I couldn't be more impressed by you in so many different layers, but I think the overriding thing is is your optimism, uh, lack of bitterness, and to take your experience and use it to truly affect change and and positive change. And, and you could have done so many other things that could have been negative because such a negative thing happened to you. And you've taken all that and that's like pumped you up like a superhero to go out and speak to people. And they want to hear this. This is, this is stuff that people need to hear. Innocent people shouldn't go to prison. Not, and then the many, as many people as you're talking about in Michigan, there's a whole wave of those people. I, I remember watching, um, or I was talking to Russ Faria the other day, who was accused of murder in Missouri. And they, on Dateline, they interviewed the prosecuting attorney, who's no longer the prosecuting attorney, but she could still not say that he was an innocent man. She said, wow. I still haven't seen the evidence. And I, it was like every single person yeah. who's watching this has already seen the evidence, and she still couldn't admit it. Real, real quick, um, we're, we're going to the prison to pick up a guy, or um, his family's going to pick him up, but we're going to be there at the prison tomorrow. He's going to be exonerated tomorrow. Wow. Um, now, this guy, uh, DNA, DNA evidence um, exonerates him. And not only does it exonerate him, it, it, it shows who the real perpetrator is. Um, yet, although DNA evidence exonerates him, a police officer went to the judge um, and stopped his hearing. He was supposed to get out last week. This has never been done before. Um, and it's a lot of outrage going on right now, but um, he will be out tomorrow. And, um, you know, we will be speaking out against this delay. You know, he's innocent and everybody knows it. Yeah. Yet, he he was forced to be in there for a whole nother week. How long, um, because how long was he? Uh, how long did he end up serving? Um, he was convicted in two thousand six, two thousand seven. So he's been in a long um, time. I believe, yeah, I believe he was in the county jail for 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 a little while before that, even before that. Um, well, but yeah, yeah, it, it, that's just you know it, it it really does blow your mind because you know DNA evidence is DNA evidence, and they and like you said, they actually know who else has done it, and and uh, they're still trying right. to block an innocent guy from walking away. Right. Marvin, I got to tell you, I have so enjoyed meeting you. I have just so enjoyed interviewing you. I want to stay in touch with you. I want other people to stay in touch with you. How do you, how do you contribute to your campaign? What's your, what, how do, how do, what's the uh, contacts? Well, um, you can definitely contact me on Facebook. It's my name, Marvin Cotton Jr. Um, I'm also on Instagram, the, underscore real underscore FMC, the FMC, um, free Marvin cotton. So, I like it. I kind of, I kind of kept that. So it's the real FMC, the underscore real underscore FMC. Um, and you can contact me on there. Uh, my act blue account is being set up. That's, um, a way to donate uh, politically to uh, democratic candidates. So that'd be set up soon. Okay. Um, you know, your viewers can definitely reach out to me and I can keep them updated. Um, they can send me their emails and I'll keep them updated on everything that's going on. Um, I definitely need the support. Um, I need a backing. So um, anybody that believes in what it is that I'm doing, um, definitely line up behind me so that I can make some more things happen. I love it. I love it. For those, uh, uh, you know, who listen and subscribe, uh, if you're on, on Apple, uh, leave a review. Um, if you're still looking for a book out there, I've got one that I wrote. It's called Nightmare Success. You can also get us on YouTube. Um, Marvin Cotton Jr., man, what a story. What a guy. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. And and, and if you can, maybe um, leave the link to that uh, YouTube video on, on your channel. I will do that because everybody uh, will like seeing that who listened to this today. All right, Absolutely. everybody. Nightmare Success in and out. Thanks for being here.